Good evening, everybody. Welcome at the Schumann Lecture 2012. This special lecture organized by Maastricht University and the city of Maastricht. To introduce our special guest of this evening, the speaker, I introduce to you the mayor, our mayor of Maastricht, Onno Hoes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I just appointed, I, I just explained during dinner to our professor, our distinguished guest, distinguished guest for tonight, how it is to be an appointed mayor. But you see, it doesn't mind if you are elected or appointed, I will give you an applause anyway. <laughs> I'm delighted, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to welcome you here for the 18th Schumann Lecture, an annual school event organized by the Studium General of the Maastricht University in collaboration with the municipality of Maastricht. The Schumann Lecture is named after the former French Foreign Minister and Prime Minister Robert Schumann. After the Second World War, he was a strong advocate of reconciliation between France and Germany. As such, he was one of the founders of Europe. Moreover, he was a driving force behind the setting up of the European coal and steel community. Today, the 7th of May, 2012, that may seem part of history, but Robert Schumann's legacy is still very evident in Maastricht, and perhaps now more than ever. It is not only because 2012 is the year in which we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Maastricht Treaty, and it's 10 years since the first euro saw the light of day on the market square, market square here in Maastricht. But also because we are even more aware that now that our future lies in international and European cooperation. Maastricht is a candidate for European Capital of Culture in 2018 and has become increasingly clear during the preparations that we have to reinvigorate our routes to the EU region. The national borders have literally drawn a line through our joint history, and now we are about to remove those barriers. Not so much in a national and political sense, but rather by emphasizing our joint cultural links. Ladies and gentlemen, Europe is currently involved in a serious crisis. The euro is unstable, politicians have no ready-made solutions, Citizens have their doubts about cohesion between the member states and the future-proof nature of the European project in general. Citizens are also doubting their own role regarding future developments. It has led to increased self-centered attitudes and a greater emphasis on national interests. It's therefore important to redefine Europe. And that's exactly what we are doing here, although in a small scale. The 11 partners in the EU region, Meuse Rhine, who are jointly supporting the candidacy of cultural capital, are rejuvenating Europe. Not along economic and financial lines, but by means of culture. We believe that the similarities and the differences between those who live, work and study here in the EU region are a source of inspiration for a new approach on the road to a united Europe, with our short-term focus being European Capital of Culture in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, the speaker for the 2012 Schumann Lecture has the same focus, even though that focus extends beyond the EU region most Ryan, at least I hope for tonight. But I would like to assure our guest speaker this evening that part of the crisis can be solved in the various international regions in Europe in which people and their cultural characteristics are central. Perhaps I'm being too hasty in suggesting a solution to the problem that our speaker has yet to outline. So I will conclude and introduce our main guest for the evening. He is Professor of European Studies, University of Oxford. Yesiah Berlin Professorial Fellow at St. Anthony's College in Oxford, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, 
and the author of nine books of political writing or history of the present, which have charted the transformation of Europe over the last 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Timothy Garten Esch. The floor is yours. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mayor Rector. It's a huge pleasure to be here uh, in Maastricht. Um, the former British Prime Minister, uh, John Major, used to say um, back in the early 1990s that, that Britain was at the heart of Europe, um, and people used to laugh quite a lot about that. Um, well, I feel that here in Maastricht we really are at the heart of Europe. Uh, here you have all the many layers of European history from the Roman to the present, all the intricacies, the legacies of past conflicts, the interactions. And of course, as was just mentioned, Maastricht has become a name, a word in world history as the name of the treaty that led to the so-called economic and monetary union which is now in a profound crisis. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the way people react when they hear the word Maastricht will actually depend on what happens in that crisis and the outcome of that crisis. In other words, if the whole thing goes completely pear-shaped and down the tubes, then people may have a, a marginally less positive reaction than they do at the moment. Um, and actually, of course, we meet at a critical moment. Uh, we just had the French elections, the Greek elections. I'd be happy to talk about all of that in the discussion period afterwards. What's Hollande going to say to Merkel? What's going to come out of the Greek elections and so on? I'm happy to talk about that in discussion. I, um, I, um, and you can read about it in tomorrow's Financial Times. Um, I want to go a little bit deeper in this Schumann lecture, and I want to examine the origins of this crisis, and then, which is to say also the origins of what people around the world call, quote-unquote, Maastricht, and then uh, to ask why it's proving so difficult to get out of it. Okay. Um, the historians sometimes distinguish between crises of European integration and crises in European integration. It's a distinction made by Professor Ludger Kuhnhardt. This is clearly a crisis not just in, but a crisis of European integration. It is an existential crisis of the European project, uh, perhaps the biggest that we have experienced for many decades. And the question it poses is, is the old pattern of European integration going to be reproduced, namely integration through crisis, challenge and response? Because again and again in the history of European integration, you have seen a further step of integration coming in response to the crisis, challenge and response. And the question is, is that going to happen this time or not? And if not, why not? And if yes, why? Okay, so there are two parts to what I'm going to say. The first is to look at how we got to what the world calls Maastricht, the treaty that eventually gave us the euro, and the second part, why it's proving so difficult to get out of it. Now, as all, as, as all of you know, and I'm sure every student at Maastricht University knows this, um, there were many, many precursors of the idea of a European monetary union. There was the argument a single market requires a single currency. There was the Werner Report uh, approved in 1970, which said it should come in in 1980, and so on and so forth. There was a single European Act, which set the wonderful target goal of 1992, 
the single European market. Now, a German politician of whom one or two of you may have heard, called Wolfgang Schäuble, familiar name perhaps, wrote a book in the early 1990s. Um, uh, at that point, he was a great pro-European. Um, and he quoted Jacques Delors uh, to the following effect. We were all waiting for 1992, and what happened was 1989. And there's a great deal of truth in that. The connections between these two things are, however, extremely complicated and very interesting. Students of history will know that as a general rule, something cannot be caused by something else that happened afterwards, right? That is generally held to be a fallacy. But there is a curious sense in which 1992 was in some sense also a contributing cause of 1989. What do I mean by that? I mean, and, and I speak as someone who was traveling constantly in Eastern Europe through the 1980s, that the sense that Western Europe was uniting in an extraordinarily dynamic and prosperous community and just running streets ahead of a declining and decaying Eastern Europe. And the symbol of that was 1992, was a contributory cause of the Velvet Revolutions of 1989, right? And that was true not just in East Central Europe, it was also true to some extent in the Soviet Union, because if you look at the memoirs of Gorbachev and co, the Gorbachev generation, they say very clearly, look, we could just see how dynamic economically and politically Western Europe was and how our own system was stagnating. So in an ironical sense, 1992 was a cause of 1989. More important for our subject today, 1989, was a very important cause of what actually happened in 1992, that is to say, not just the completion of a single market, which arguably has still not to be completed, but the Maastricht Treaty, which led to Europe, European Monetary Union. In what sense? Because the prospect of German unification and then the reality of German unification dramatically, dramatically catalyzed the process of moving towards economic and monetary union. This is not to say that some monetary union would not have happened at some point between some member states. It probably would. It is to say that this particular monetary union in the particular form which is now in crisis, happening at that particular time, was a result of that particular historical constellation. And I'd like, if I may, because I think it's very, very interesting, just to dwell on a bit of the historical detail. And for some of you um, who are students of history, you can do this through a number of wonderful archival sources, uh, including the special edition of the Dokumente zur Deutschlandpolitik, which documents in marvelous detail from primary sources the history of German unification. This may seem, ladies and gentlemen, a long, long way away from what you want to talk about the European crisis today, but believe me, it isn't. Okay, so here we have a, a, the kind of record that would not normally be released for 20 or 30 years, of a private conversation between then Federal Chancellor Helmut Kohl and then Italian Prime Minister Signor Andriotti, a name may also be familiar to you. And essentially what happens in this record, and this is the 18th of October 1989, is that Andriotti is saying to Kohl, when are we going to get on with monetary union? 
I want a date. I want to, I want to tie you down to a date for an intergovernmental conference to get on with the Economic and Monetary Union. And uh, we're worried about various aspects of it, he says, including the um, liberalization of capital taxes on, on capital movements, because he says, this is the German minute, can I read it to you in German first and then translate for those who don't know German? Dies schaffe in Italian Probleme, denn bekanntlich sei die Steuermoral, wonderful world, die Steuermoral, dort nicht so gut wie beispielsweise in der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. <laughs> so tax morality was perhaps not quite as good, and so he was worried about capital running away, he says, to Luxembourg. And um, so, so there we are, and... and Federal Chancellor Cole, okay, gives a pretty cautious answer, not, not committing himself. Then we have a conversation on the 2nd of November 1989 with Prime Minister, French Prime Minister Rocard, Michel Rocard, of the same party of one Francois Hollande who's just won the French presidential election. It's essential, says Rocard, that we must press ahead with West European integration precisely because things are moving so fast in in Germany and particularly in East Germany. When are we going to have this date for the uh, economic and monetary union? And um, then he talks about being worried about the harmonization of VAT and various other problems. And Helmut Kohl is once again really quite cautious in the commitment he makes. Then we have uh, a note uh, written by Helmut Kohl's right-hand man, Horst Telchik, in preparation for a special meeting in the Elysee in Paris on the 18th of November 1989, specially called by François Mitterrand, uh, to talk about the next European summit. Now, um, hands up those of you who can remember what happened between the 2nd of November 1989 and the 17th of November 1989. Hands up, everybody. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, more hands, please. Remember, remember, the 9th of November 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall had come down. Now, if you remember, if you remember, François Mitterrand was initially as, how shall I put it, unenthusiastic uh, about uh, the prospect of German unification, as was Margaret Thatcher. There's little doubt about this, um, particularly, by the way, when speaking to Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and the British have now published their diplomatic records which show that François Mitterrand, um, uh, um, who famously said of Margaret Thatcher that she has the eyes of Caligula and the mouth of Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> uh, uh, he, he was a great admirer of Margaret Thatcher. He liked that combination. <laughs> And, and she actually rather liked him. Um, he kept stirring her up to be more resolute in her opposition to German unification. And you can see this from the German records. Meanwhile, Mitterrand, clever old fox that he was, having recognized after a period of time when he tried to stop it, that this was going to happen anyway, said, okay, it's going to happen anyway, but I'm going to get my price. And my price is going to be binding the Federal Republic of Germany, reunited Germany, into the European Union through the Economic and Monetary Union. And if you go through the documents, this is absolutely clear. Remember that France had the presidency uh, in the second half of 1989, and here we have a secret message or private message from Chancellor Cole to President Mitterrand saying how much indeed he welcomes the prospect 
of moving towards a timetable for economic and monetary union under the French presidency, but there are one or two details that have to be worked out along the way, he said, hearing the voice of the Bundesbank whispering in his ear. Then we have, uh, you, some of you will recall that a key moment on the path to German unification was Chancellor Kohl's so-called 10-point plan. And here we have the report from Horst Telchik, his right-hand man, on reactions around the world to the 10-point plan. What is the reaction in France? The answer is absolutely clear. It's here black on white. This is excellent. We're delighted at the prospect of German unification, but it must happen in the context of European integration, and at the heart of that must be, yes, the economic and monetary union. And so it continues, and so we move forward through to the Strasbourg summit um, under French presidency, and here we have President Mitterrand writing to Helmut Kohl in advance of the Strasbourg summit. Great emphasis on the, um, uh, as you guessed, economic and monetary union and the timetable for it. Um, and then he says, and about these details that you've been raising with some concern, and can I read you this? I, I can see that most of you understand German. Die Wirtschafts- und Finanzminister können weiterhin unter irischer und italienischer Präsidentschaft die Überlegungen zur Koordinierung der Haushalte verfeinern. Um, so under the Irish and Italian presidencies, these details of the coordination of budgets uh, can be refined. Uh, think about that from the perspective of 2012 and think how delicately the details of the coordination of budgets have been uh, achieved in the, in the Eurozone and um, uh, how that might have something to do with the problems that we face today. In March 1990, we have a secret meeting between, or series of meetings between Horst Telchik, Kohl's right-hand man, and Jacques Attali, um, uh, Cole's right-hand man, which pins down the timetable, essentially, towards an economic and monetary union, while insisting that there should also be a political union to complement it, that is to say, a fiscal and political union. Um, I hope I don't bore you with the story. I myself find it quite intriguing, and not least because we now get to a um, historic city, um, not unknown to you, called Maastricht, where, according to a book which I commend to you by David Marsh, uh, called The Bundesbank, David Marsh was one of the best journalists working on these issues then writing for the Financial Times, I quote, the decisive meeting at Maastricht took place before the summit had even started. Normally at such gatherings, François Mitterrand was the last participant to arrive. As befits the grandest guest at the party, you always arrive late. This time he turned up early. It was a clear indication of a preemptive strike. On the evening of Sunday 8th December, the French president met veteran, veteran Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti, Remember my first quotation. Um, it says, at his hotel just outside Maastricht. Um, I hope one of you will be able to tell me afterwards where exactly that hotel was. And um, I look forward to hearing. And they agreed how to get this thing through the next day at the Maastricht summit, which was to say, let's make it obligatory for countries to join the EMU, what becomes the Euro, if they fulfill certain stringent, rigorous German-style conditions, such as the 3% limit on deficits and the 60% limit on public debt. And sure enough, give or take a few details, that's what we got in the Maastricht 
treaty, and two days later that was greeted in the Bildzeitung with the following enthusiastic title, Das Ende der Mark, <laughs> the end of the Deutschmark. Does that sound familiar to you from the perspective of today? Now, very often in European debates these days, as we look at the current European crisis, you hear people calling for more leadership. We've all heard that, haven't we? Particularly from former leaders of various countries in the European Union, with the clear implication that when they were around, there was leadership. But now these epigones, these mere dwarves who have followed, show no leadership. Well, there is an element of truth in this, so I want to add only an element of truth. Because Helmut Kohl certainly showed leadership. He showed extraordinary leadership in achieving German unification, uh, which not every chancellor would have done. As he rightly said, the window to German unification was only open for a few months, and he got through it in time. But he also showed extraordinary leadership in pushing through European monetary union. And he didn't exactly ask the German people. He told them. He certainly didn't have a referendum, which of course was not allowed by German constitutional law because of the somewhat unfortunate consequences of referendums earlier in the 20th century. But he pushed it through. He really did push it through for a very reluctant German public, as many of you will know, a German public which was profoundly attached to the Deutschmark, which it saw not only quite rightly as a stable and hard currency, a key to the Wirtschaftswunder, but also as in some sense a symbol of post-war West German identity. One might almost say, I exaggerate slightly, that what the Westminster Houses of Parliament are to the British, the Deutschmark was to the West Germans. But Kohl always wanted to have a political union to complement the economic and monetary union. He was very clear about this. Ten days before the Maastricht conference, uh, conference, he said, political union and economic and monetary union are inseparably linked. The one is the unconditional complement of the other. We cannot and will not give up sovereignty over monetary policy if political union remains a castle in the air. Well, I leave it to you to judge how much of a political union we got through the Maastricht Treaty. Not much. We got European citizenship, but only through being the citizen of a member state, not directly. We got the Committee of the region, Regions, not wholly insignificant, as the mayor just pointed out. We got in, uh, enhanced powers for the European Parliament. But essentially, the European Union, as we now called it, is still fundamentally, fundamentally an organization of the member states. Arguably, it's more intergovernmental today at 27 than it was 20 years ago, and arguably the European Commission is weaker than it was under Jacques Delors. So not much political union there. But Cole wanted it. And if the chance had come, you can be sure he would have taken it. Okay, this brings me forward to where we are today. At the time when this complex deal was made in this city, which resulted in, nearly slightly less than 10 years later, in European Monetary Union, the Euro, um, there was a joke that did the rounds, and the joke was the whole of Deutschland for coal half the Deutschmark from Mitterrand. 
it was a little too sharp, perhaps, because it wasn't as simple as that by any manner of means, because Cole himself wanted Germany at the moment of European Union to be bound into a larger European structure. He wanted what are sometimes called the golden handcuffs of European Union to be put on. But in making the monetary union in the way we did in the Treaty of Maastricht and the subsequent detailed negotiations, we put the cart before the horse, right? We made a monetary union without the fiscal union and implicitly elements of political union that traditionally have been needed to sustain a la longue a monetary union, a la longue a stable monetary union. And we knew that. We knew that at the time. We knew it all along. All the critics said that. The crisis we have today is to adapt Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the chronicles of a crisis foretold. We knew that this problem would come the difference is that when the moment comes, when you have to move forwards towards more elements of a fiscal, i.e. also political union, as a response to the crisis of the Eurozone, the kind of willingness and leadership that clearly would have been there had Helmut Kohl still been in office and Mitterrand and others is no longer there. And so you have the challenge, the expected and predicted challenge, the expected and predicted crisis, but you don't have the response. And that is why, what, three, four years into the crisis of the Euro, we are where we are. And that brings me to the history of the present, to the present crisis. Um, as one or two of you will have noticed, um, France has just voted. It has the first socialist president since François Mitterrand. And one day I hope to read the transcript of his first conversation with Chancellor Angela Merkel. <laughs> and like the one I read you between Kohl and Mitterrand, it will make very interesting reading Indeed, because he, as you know, has said in the election campaign more than once, I quote, it is not for Germany to decide for the rest of Europe. He said that very clearly in the campaign. He said he's not necessarily going to sign the fiscal compact without uh, renegotiation. And he's going into that meeting with some significant demands. And we shall talk in the discussion period about whether those demands, A, should be met, and B, will be met. But what I want to do before throwing it open to discussion is once again to step back and to ask a slightly deeper question, which is, why, given this existential crisis of the whole European project, have we not had that immediate urgent response, which says we have to solve this problem, we have to save the euro, we have to save the eurozone, coot que coot, okay? Why has the reaction been so reluctant, so hesitant indeed in many countries, including, by the way, I, mean, I don't need to mention my own because that's obvious, but in even countries like the Netherlands, um, you know, pretty reluctant. Let me suggest to you quickly four reasons, four deeper reasons, why that mechanism that worked so many times through a half century of European integration no longer seems to be working. Number one, what drove the project of European Union forward for more than a half century were personal memories of war, occupation, genocide, holocaust, dictatorship, fascist and communist, all the horrors of the first half of the 20th century, which into the generation 
of Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand and indeed Andreotti and Jacques Delors were an absolute personal driving force. We must make Europe never again that, and you know a bit about the history of the 20th century just by looking at the history of your own city and the wars that have been fought over it. Now no more. That huge, probably the most important single motor of European integration for more than half a century is no longer there. And in the current generation of leaders of Merkel and Hollande or Donald Tusk or David Cameron, it's just history. It's not the personal memory. Now, of course, history is what we have as a collective version of personal memory. But clearly, we haven't done a very good job of internalizing that history. And in my view, that is the single most important reason we haven't had the same kind of response. Second huge motor of European integration for half a century, the Soviet threat. Go back through the documents. Look at the decisive moments. The fact that the Red Army was in the center of Europe, divided Germany, half of Europe occupied by the Soviet Union, was an absolute driving force of European integration, up to and including the moment of Maastricht. The Soviet Union was the negative external integrator of the European Union. No more. Gone. All respect to Vladimir Putin, but are we frightened of Vladimir Putin? Not me. Not even the Poles are frightened of Vladimir Putin anymore. Third great motor of European integration, the United States. In the context of the Cold War, the United, the United States, with great imagination, and I stress this, and statecraft, recognized that what it had to do was to support by every means available from the Marshall Plan to intellectual and cultural support, the building up of a strong united Europe, quite unlike that which had led to the, last two, the two world wars. And so all the way through to the 1980s, right, you have the United States as a great motor and supporter of European unification. No more. All gone. Forget it. Okay? Barack Obama likes the idea of the European Union. In many ways, he's a kind of honorary European. At least in his domestic policy, he's the closest thing we've had to a European president. He's a kind of social democrat. He believes in the welfare state. He believes in social justice. But in foreign policy, is he going to lift a single finger to try and push forward European integration, forget it. Absolutely not. It's very, very striking. The Obama administration is entirely realist in, a, in its approach to Europe. It says, we'd actually be quite pleased if you could get your act together because it's awfully boring and time-consuming dealing with 27 different countries, <laughs> all of whom want half an hour with Hillary Clinton if not with Barack Obama. But clearly you're not getting your act together, so we will take Europe as we find it, weak, divided, and hypocritical. And therefore, we deal with the individual countries of Europe, except when it comes to trade, competition policy, regulation policy, where the European Commission really has teeth, and where the European Commission has teeth, then we deal with the European Commission. If you look at the Obama administration's foreign policy, it's about relations with individual countries, Britain, France, Germany, Poland, you name it, okay? So the, four, the third great motor of European integration, the United States, no longer there. And the fourth great motor of European integration for more than half a century? Guess. The Federal Republic of Germany. The Federal Republic, everyone talks about the Franco-German couple. And by the way, the economy is not wrong, and that's, I mean, it wasn't a wrong answer, but just not the right answer. <laughs> People talk about the Franco-German couple. 
the great motor of European integration for a half century was the Federal Republic of Germany. It had an exceptional commitment to European integration for two reasons. I actually wrote a whole book about this um, uh, called In Europe's Name, published in the early 1990s, and what I argued there is that Germany had to have this exceptional commission, commitment, first of all, that it had an exceptional commitment to European integration, which it did, and that it had it for two reasons, because it wanted to and because it had to. It wanted to because after the horror and shame of Nazism, Germans wished passionately to rehabilitate themselves in the civilized community of European nations. Shapoba, it's a great motive, it was magnificent, but it had to, because if Germany was ever to achieve its central national goal of German unification, it could only do so with the support and trust of its neighbors and allies. And how do you get that support and trust? By proving your European credentials. Witness the documents I cited at the beginning of this lecture. 3rd of October 1991, compliment about the Maastricht Treaty, mission accomplished. Germany united. And then the question becomes, will Germany retain this exceptional commitment to European integration that it had for all these years as West Germany? Or will it simply become what we call, what was called in the German discourse, a quote unquote normal nation state? Where by normal we mean something like Britain or France. If by Britain or France we can say normal. Today the question has been answered. Germany is a second France, though without the delusions of grandeur. It is, in all essentials, a quote-unquote normal European nation-state. That is to say, a state which pursues its interests in this sense more like France than Britain through Europe, if it possibly can, and will go to considerable lengths to do so, but on its own if it must. So if it comes to energy, it will make its own deal with Russia. If it comes to trade, it will make its own deals with China. Through Europe, if it can, on its own, if it must. And you know what? There's nothing very wrong with that. I have no problem at all with countries calmly defining their own national interests. And by the way, the British and the French are the last people who can possibly object to this, because this is what we've been doing for centuries. Um, in the French case, doing it in Europe's name. In the British case, doing it just in our own name. You can judge which is more effective, but we've both been doing it. I have no problem at all with Germany calmly defining its own national interests. The problem comes if it does not define those interests clearly and in the longer term. And in my own opinion, that is more the problem in the German debate about the Euro today. Uh, that it's a highly emotional debate. Why should we pay for all these impecunious Southern Europeans? Read the Bild Zeitung any day of the well, where we've been prudent and massaged down our unit labor costs and so on and so forth. Let me step aside for a moment here and say that as so often in history, this is a tale of unintended consequences. As I've demonstrated to you with those documents at the outset, the essential perception in Germany at the time of unification was that giving up the Deutschmark, European Monetary Union, was paying an economic price, price for political gain, right? It turns out that actually Germany has done extremely well economically 
from the euro. Now, I know this is disputed by some economists. Maybe some in the room will dispute it. Some do in Germany. I myself have very little doubt that Germany has done very well economically out of the euro. Out of the euro. But now, to some extent, the bill is being presented. And when that bill is presented, and when the moment comes which Helmut Kohl knew would come, and actually wanted to come, when the monetary union in the old functionalist fashion compels you to move forwards towards a fiscal union, ergo more political union, Germany is curiously reluctant to do so. So that while not everything depends on Germany at this moment, a very great deal clearly does depend on Germany, on, on German leadership, a German leadership which calmly defines its own enlightened long-term national interest. Uh, you know, at the time of German unification, German policymakers constantly quoted a line that goes back to Thomas Mann, which was, we want not a German Europe, but a European Germany, right? The outcome which nobody at that time expected, including me, is the one which we're quite close to in the European Union at the moment, which is a European Germany in a German Europe. That is to say, a highly civilized, liberal democratic, in every respect admirably European Germany, on which nonetheless the fate of Europe defends because economic and monetary union was put at the heart of the, monetary, of, the, of the European project. So a huge amount depends on Germany, of course on Italy. Mario Monti has a, I think, significant influence on Angela Merkel. On France, we shall see. Britain, I wish. I truly, truly wish. You are looking at one of that endangered speeches. <laughs> someone, who, the British pro-European, someone who defines himself as an English European. But we are vastly on the defensive at the moment. Um, there was a poll recently um, asking the, the, the Brits about, um, about the Euro and whether, whether um, that they thought Britain should join the euro, and, and the result was 80% uh, said never, <laughs> but 4% said yes right now. So there are 4% you can still count on, but uh, that's against 80. But more seriously, more seriously, I think the absence of Europe, uh, of Britain, from these crucial decisions for Europe's future, including David Cameron's lamentable stance at the summit in December, is a disaster, not just for Britain in the long term. In the long term, I emphasize, not economically in the short term. In the short term, we're not doing, but in the long term. But also for Europe, because what is the great new case for the European project today? beyond the arguments we all know. It is the one that Jean Monnet anticipated in one of his wonderfully perceptive remarks when he talked about um, the need for a strong Europe à la mesure de l'Amérique et de la Russie aujourd'hui, de la Chine et de l'Inde demain, China and India tomorrow. And that was an amazingly perceptive thing for Jean Monnet to say 50 years ago. But now we're there. We're in the world which China and India and Brazil and South Africa and the emerging giants of the post-Western world are shaping. And that is the most compelling rationale for the European project in our time. That in this new world of giants, even the largest single European country, Germany, will soon be but a dwarf. In the world of giants, it helps to be a giant yourself. And that is, in my view, the single most compelling intellectual argument for the central importance of the European Union today. 
Of course, saving the Eurozone, the future of the European Union also depends on other major players, other countries in the European Union, including, of course, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, other founding members. But can I just say finally, and with this, I want to throw it open for discussion, that above all, it depends on you. Because it's all very well belly aching about the lack of leadership. But the future of the European Union depends on its citizens, on its people. It is untrue to say that this is a purely undemocratic project. Even though the democracy of Brussels is an indirect democracy, what is slowing the project down, stalling the project at the moment, also in respect of saving the Eurozone, is precisely the reluctance of public opinions, of the people expressed through politics, through their parties. And so, if there is not a great mobilization of the citizens of Europe, and that means you, that means particularly the young people of Europe, who have, who live in the best Europe we have ever had, and there is just no question about it, this is the best Europe ever, full stop, period, the best Europe there has ever been in European history. If you are not prepared to mobilize to save that Europe, and that does mean, in the first place, saving the Eurozone, then future historians will look back and say that somewhere between the Treaty of Maastricht and the crisis that began in 2008 and 2009, the extraordinary story of European integration reached its highest point and that what happened subsequently was a story more of disintegration than of integration. And if that happens, it will be at least in part because you didn't mobilize to save it. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, there are quite some experts in the audience on the European Union and probably also on the European crisis, so I expect quite some questions and a vibrant discussion. Who would like to start? Over there, could you? We have a mic, and we need it. Here in front, on the third row. My name is uh, Stephen Tycon. I'm an architect and an in investigative journalist with uh, Politico.com. My first uh, question would be a request to you, with, uh, which I would uh, articulate uh, in a moment. If you want to know the reason why Obama didn't lift a finger to save the Europe, the Europe uh, this time and uh, how the German Holocaust became a global polycast, you visit my website, europeanunity.com, uh, .eu, of course. Now, the, my request is uh, to you, would you be so kind to ask the audience who in the audience thinks that European governments are working for the citizens or the international global banking cartel? Okay, thank you. Um, would you mind answering these questions one by one, or...? Um, I, I have a... Was that a question, I wonder? <laughs> I think we'll take another. Okay. Thank you. Over there. 
Fourth row. Please. So, um, my question is twofold. It's probably not entirely unexpected. Um, the first th uh, part of the question is, um, yeah, in the first talks between uh, Mr. Hollande and Ms. Merkel, um, you were talking about the demands of Mr. Hollande. And, um, yeah, do you think they should be met and do you think they will be met? Thank you. If I knew that, I would belong to one of those international banking cartels that have just been talked about and <laughs> be, be and, and be as ludicrously overpaid. And, and by the way, I think I owe the gentleman the, the, the courtesy of, of, of at least a brief reply, which is that I do actually think that while um, the world is not run by Bilderberg or big corporations, that money plays far too large a role in all our politics, in all our politics, including notably in the United States, and that the financial sector has got away with murder, colloquially speaking, um, in a way that many other sectors would not. And so I, 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 there's no question that that is part of the etiology, part of the origins of, of the crisis we face. Uh, in terms of Hollande Merkel, um, let me take the second question first. Should they? I do not see how the weaker economies of southern Europe can get out of a debt deflation trap without more growth. Uh, if you're Spain, what, 24%? Thank you. And, 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 an analytical comment rather than a political statement, but 24% unemployment going on, 50% youth unemployment, those levels of debt, how are you going to pay down the debt, get down the deficits, unless you get growth? And in that sense, I think Hollande, and by the way, uh, the British Labour Party, and the German Social Democrats and um, many American economies and uh, economists and many, many others around Europe are right. So I think that you cannot do it simply by the austerity formula which Germany is proposing at the moment. I mean, I, I hasten to add, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to get into the detail, but that seems to me fairly clear. I think what is correct is that in the longer term, you do need the kind of structural reform that Germany implemented extremely impressively by consensus under the Schroeder government. And you look at the way they massage down unit labor costs while Greek and Portuguese labor costs soared in, in, the, in the 10 years. I mean, that's a, so we need that structural reform. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. So to that extent, I think that Hollande is right, and I hope we do get some more growth stimulus components into how we address the Eurozone crisis. Now, next question is obviously, where do those come from? Uh, that's obviously more difficult. Ask your economists, but I think the basic insight is correct. Will he get it? It depends, like almost everything else that Angela Merkel does, on German domestic politics. Because Angela Merkel, and this is both her great strength and her great weakness, is the most brilliant domestic politician. She's the most brilliant winner of elections, right? And so she's looking at the elections coming up in Nordrhein-Westfalen, She's looking at the opinion polls. She's wondering what's going to happen to her current coalition partner. She's saying, should I work towards a grand coalition with the Social Democrats? And if she thinks that her future lies, for example, in a grand coalition with the Social Democrats, then it will be that much more attractive for her to make a deal with the Social Democrats' sister party in France, the Socialist Party. So I think 
The, the, the second part of your question, I'm sorry, this is a long answer, but it's a very important question. The answer to the second part of that depends on whether Merkel makes that political calculation and thinks that she can face down the Bildzeitung, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, and the Bundesbank. Yes, please. Yeah. My name is Kalle. I'm a student here in European Studies at the university. And my question is uh, whether do you see the future of Europe mainly in economic terms or how do you perceive uh, contemporary threats, for example, to human rights and upcoming populism like we have seen in many, many European countries? Thank you very much. Um, I think that's a in really important question. First of all, um, the problem with the functionist method, which is going through economic means to political ends, is that as so often in history, with time the means come to be seen as ends in themselves. Uh, Europe is a political project or it is nothing. That is the purpose. The purpose of Europe is political. Number two, one of the great problems of today's Europe is that the Europe of democracy and the rule of law and human rights is still far too much divorced from the economic Europe of the European Union. So if I as a citizen feel that my rights have been violated, I don't go to the European Court of Justice, I go to the European Court of Human Rights, that is to say the Court of the Council of Europe. And my old friend, late lamented friend, Ralph Darndorf, used to say that one of the great, great failures of the European project over the last 20 to 30 years was not to bring these two Europes closer together. And I, I believe that is profoundly true, because what now happens is that you have countries inside the European Union, member states of the European Union, which are flagrantly violating the standards that we preach to the rest of the world, the standards that we demand of candidate countries to the European Union. I need only mention Hungary to give you just one example. And nothing happens because there are virtually no mechanisms in the way, virtually no, I am that virtually no, there are a few, but virtually no mechanisms for genuinely implementing and effectively implementing what we regard as European values and European standards in the way EU member states treat, for example, their own minorities. And I think that is a great, great lack. So the answer to your question is, it has to be a political project and a moral project, or it is nothing. Well, good evening. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Andrea Gonzalez and I am currently studying economics. Uh, I also believe that the uh, European project of integration requires some transfer of sovereignty from some countries to, the, to a European central government. So my question would be, what do you think that it's necessary or if it's, if it's actually possible to um, create a federal Europe-like system and if uh, politicians will be able to do that on time and if not um, to which extent will this integration be substituted um, for a coordination thank you very much well I'm getting very modest small questions here tonight um, so uh, let me give you a partial answer in, in two parts number one the way the Eurozone has evolved, um, I see no way round a fiscal and transfer union. Uh, I do not see how the Eurozone as it currently is constituted can be durably saved without a fiscal and transfer union. And to secure a fiscal and transfer union you would need elements of a kind of federal polity. Not, not a total federation as you have, for example, in the United States, but elements of. Okay, so that might not have been necessary. Europe could have developed in other ways if we'd gone in different ways 20 or 30 years ago, but I think within the Eurozone, 
some elements of what you might like to call federalism will be needed. And so the question before us is, are, do we have the courage, do we have the will to go towards them over what period of time and among how many states? Okay, that's, no, that's point number one. Point number two is, if we're dealing with China or Russia or India, it's not the Eurozone that is the partner for Moscow or for Beijing or for that matter for Washington. It's the European Union of 27, soon to be 28, going on 29, 30, 31 member states. And so in whatever we do in the Eurozone, we have to make sure it doesn't end up uniting the Eurozone at the price of dividing the European Union. Okay? So you've also got to answer the question, how is the European Union as a whole going to remain an effective actor in the world? And I believe it can. I believe you don't need a monetary union and you don't need a fiscal union and you don't need a political union to have an effective, coordinated European foreign policy. Right? Um, you need good institutions in Brussels, good diplomats, a good external action service, which we're trying to build up, a good high representative for foreign and security policy, which we will get one day, <laughs> and above all, the political will of member states. And I think the way European foreign policy can work is where you have, uh, this term is unfortunately slightly discredited by the Iraq war, but it's a perfectly good term, coalitions of the willing, right? So you have a number of member states which on a particular issue say this is what the policy should be and the rest are prepared to go along. And let me give you a, a, an example, policy towards Ukraine until recently, yeah? Which was quite effective, there was a common U U European policy and it wasn't just France, Germany and Britain that made that policy, Poland was just as important. If it were Morocco, Spain and France would be as important. You know, it doesn't have to be the, uh, the, only the three or four big countries. And that model, I believe, given the political will, could deliver a Europe speaking with a single voice, able to deal, able to deal with the giants of the 21st century without necessarily being federal. First row. First row. Over there, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you uh, first for the very interesting speech. Um, I'm Mark Friedrich, I'm a third year European Studies student. And my question, actually, the first one you already answered in your previous answer, but um, the second one is just before I entered here, I read that Samaras gave back his mandate to form a government in Greece uh, to the president. So it will be very difficult to form a government in Greece. What consequences will this have on Europe? What, how do you see Greece? What will happen there? Again, the first answer has to be, if only I knew. Um, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, very broadly speaking, there are two ways you could look at the politics of Europe since the beginning of the financial crisis in 2008. One way of looking at it would be to say, look at this appalling growth of radical extremist, populist, xenophobics, parties of the left and right, something that won't be totally unfamiliar to you in this country, which was there before, and look how they've grown, and look at the fragmentation of the party landscape in Greece, okay? The other way of looking at it would be to say, well, if that, had, if that was 1929, then we're now in 1932 or 1933, and look how amazingly well the center has held. On the whole, I incline to the latter view. I think the center has held remarkably well in most European countries in very, very dramatic and testing circumstances. I mean, just think Spain. 24% unemployment, going up 50% youth unemployment, and yet, in some important sense, the center holds. Look at France, the center holds, okay? 
but it clearly has not held in Greece, the country which is in this dramatic predicament. I have no idea how they're going to form a government. I think it entirely possible that whatever government or coalition they cobble together will uh, want to reject the so-called memorandum, the memorandum of agreement with the European Union, and then we will be in uncharted waters. And then the leadership I'm talking about, starting with Merkel and Hollande, will be called on to act very fast, because I do not believe that you can simply lose Greece and save the rest. I think that the reaction in the markets, I think the potential run on the banks in other weaker economies um, is so precarious, so dangerous, that I simply don't think we can risk that. So I think we are in extremely dangerous and uncharted waters. Yeah. Um, again, I'd also like to say that that was a really stimulating, a very far-reaching and uh, I thought very prof profound and perceptive uh, presentation and really thank you for that. And my name is Tom Fitzgerald. I, I work in, in the European Institute for Public Administration. My, my question really is from that historical viewpoint you put on those four drivers that you spoke about. Um, I, I'm just putting the question to you. While they may seem much less significant, uh, I do feel that they, there are still strong echoes from those four drivers and they have some force still. But I also think that there has also come about a substitution of another driver and that is the coherence of the development of the European Union uh, over the last 25 years and its own survival instincts and institutions and maturing of, inst of institutions uh, and the pooling of sovereignty that has gone on uh, whereby decision making uh, takes place. So I, I'm just putting it to you that perhaps sometimes I hear, although a very positive Englishman around the issue of the EU, which is always wonderful to hear, uh, rare and wonderful, um, the, uh, there's an, an element of pessimism I still feel, uh, over pessimism about the EU project and I, I kind of reject that a little bit. Well, I certainly don't think anyone should be ethnically disqualified from the European debate. Um, not pessimism, scepticism, genuine, rigorous, intellectual scepticism about where those drivers have gone and where the new drivers may come from. And I'm afraid I don't see it. You mentioned you work in the European institutions. In the European institutions, um, um, I, I hope some young people in this room will contradict me and tell me that they are hugely excited by what goes on in Brussels every day and their first thought when they wake up in the morning is what's going on in Brussels? What's Mr. Barroso going to do today? I mean, was that a yes I heard? I mean the serious point is that you know we do we do have that uh, politics is also theater, right? It's public drama. And the United States has this in spades. We all know the actors in the Washington soap opera. We do wake up wondering what's happening with Barack and Hillary. The one thing we, all, we Europeans all have in common is America and the Washington soap opera, right? And Brussels simply doesn't do that because of the way it works, because it's a very different kind of animal. Okay, so that we don't have. And uh, frankly, I don't see us getting it anytime soon, because one of the ways we were supposed to get it was the European Parliament, right? Direct elections to the European Parliament. European Parliament has done very many very good things. I've seen this myself on many issues, human rights issues you mentioned over there, Eastern Europe, development issues, really, it does great stuff, media freedom, but it's not that point of direct democratic identification between most citizens of Europe and the European institutions. But where I do think, where I do think there is something different, and, and again, I hope 
some, some of the audience who are students will, will speak up on this, something which is really fundamentally different from when I grew up is what I call um, EasyJet Europe, by which I mean it is an amazing fact that from one end of the European Union to the other, from Portugal to Estonia, you can wake up on Friday morning and decide you're going to book a cheap flight, fly to the other end of the continent, spend a weekend, meet a man or woman, according to taste, decide to settle down there, get a job, make your life there, and you will be an equal, equally entitled, in time, fully equally entitled, but in large part equally entitled citizen of that other end of Europe. That is an amazing thing, and I think, dear audience, correct me if I'm wrong, this is something that people in Europe do value, right? So I think that if people saw that to be threatened, so that to be threatened, that everyday experience of Europe to be threatened, then you would get a mobilization in defense of Europe. The trouble today is that I don't think, and again, please correct me if you're wrong, please tell me that there is this great mobilization. I don't think people yet feel that the crisis of the Eurozone is that kind of existential threat to that lived everyday Europe. That's on the one hand. And on the other hand, China just doesn't work like the Soviet Union. It's just not felt to be the same kind of threat. So I don't see them ultimately as yet being those kind of mobilization, mobilizing forces. But I live in hope. Yeah, over there. To the right. Oh. <laughs> yes. My name is Daniel Gedanitz. I graduated from this university two years ago, and my question is actually if you agree on a proposal made by Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker on a conference in December in Germany, and there he proposed. He also, he was supposed to talk on the European crisis, but he was tired of it, and talked about European integration. And he talked about the same topics as you did, with the drivers, the motors, and that we, the young generation, the citizens, need to be the kind of new drivers of European integration. And what he was talking about or saying was that we need a new European identity and that many young people don't see the advantages, the benefits of the European integration process, of the European Union anymore, because we don't have the memory, the personal memory so meant. And one idea he presented, maybe it's not the most serious or best one, was to close down borders again for a short period of time mm -hmm. so that everybody can see what the benefits, the advantages of the European Union really are, that by this a better European identity a more European feeling can be created. My question is if you agree or you think this might be a good idea. Well, this is, of course, very close to what I was saying in the first part of my, my uh, the second half of my analysis about the absent personal memories and the way in which history, as taught in schools, does not substitute for it. Uh, but, of course, you're on a very slippery slope with Mr. Juncker there, because um, if you really wanted to get people going, then you should have a little war or two. And then, then right? <laughs> And um, that, that's not, not something I'm ready to propose even in, in, in jest. Um, although people do forget, you know, people go on with this old, old cliche about how we've had peace in Europe for, for 60 years, and they forget we haven't had peace in Europe for 60 years, because I don't know if anyone here has been to Bosnia or Kosovo, but I have. And those were wars, very nasty wars on the continent of Europe, which Europe failed to prevent. So I do think that knowing more of our history, including our very recent history, um, would help a great deal. And I actually think that the challenge of how we do that, of how we convey the lessons of the tragic part of European history without actually having to go through it ourselves is a huge, huge challenge to, to, well, to people of my profession, to historians and to educators. Yes, please. 
Thank you. Um, I'm Christian. I'm a European Studies student in my third year. And I was wondering about the driving forces for the older generation that you were mentioning, for them to unite as Europe. Um, you were talking about the threat, the Soviet threat, which, um, and the threat also existed on the other side of the curtain, which was the American threat. So I wonder if, if there wasn't, in fact, if it wasn't merely a Soviet threat, but maybe anti-communist, intrinsic anti-communist, um, anti-communism that brought those leaders together and in, because they would never like to have um, uh, this. And there was the, the possibility of France and, and Italy in the 50s to really switch over and become, because the Communist Party gained really far. So if it was maybe only an anti, anti-communist um, and union in the very beginning, and this transcended now, in, in, when this is all gone, the Cold War and the logic, into a more ne neoliberal um, um, way of, of European constitution uh, um, of Europe, of the European Union. Yeah, well, listen, fir first of all, you know, you, you said it perhaps a little bit sharply, but, but of course, one of the major American motives was of was the Cold War and the fear of bits of Western Europe going communist. I mean, it's absolutely clear. Um, there was a British satirical show in the 1960s which said, you know, it, it, we really do envy the Americans. It's so wonderful to have a positive faith. What's that? Anti-communism. <laughs> and uh, it's good to have a positive faith like anti-communism. So, of course, there's a lot of truth in that. But again, I, I do want to stress that I think um, a, n a more nuanced historical analysis would see that there were also nobler motives in American policy towards Western Europe and a larger vision in American policy towards Western Europe. I think from your usage of the word neoliberal, which is really a compliment, you probably don't agree. Um, but I think that now, if you look at it geostrategically, um, you could imagine someone sitting in Washington and saying, hey, we're being challenged by China and India and Brazil and the others, so we better get together with our closest allies and partners and friends, our nice neoliberal friends in Europe, and make a transatlantic partnership, a transatlantic free trade area make a Western Union, right? That would be a possible logic and line of thought. I see virtually no sign of that way of thinking in Washington, even amongst very liberal Americans. It's very, very striking. It was around in the 1990s as a set of ideas. It's actually not around today. And so I don't think that's how the world is going to work out. I think, I think America is going to make its own complex and tense relationship with China with Europe as a sideshow, and Europe is going to make its own complex and tense relationship with China, and that's how the world is going to be. Yeah. yeah uh, my name is Simon. I'm a European Studies student as well. Um, rebuilding the um, economy of Eastern Germany uh, took like 20 years and costed a lot of money, but um, there was like a national identity so people could understand why they have to pay for that. Um, now, rebuilding the Greek economy, or maybe also the Spanish economy, I don't know, uh, will take a lot of time as well. Um, but I doubt that there is like this European identity uh, that would be strong enough so that people in Germany or in the Netherlands understand why do they have to pay for, for Greece. Like there is now already the build side Zeitung or right-wing voices throughout Europe are like campaigning against uh, paying for Greece now like in the first or second year of the crisis. But um, do you really think this can go on for 20 years? Well, and yeah, don't you think that a more European identity would be necessary for that? And like, yeah, why do you want to make, uh, like how would you make people understand that they have to pay for Greece to build up their economy and not maybe the economy of Tunisia or Morocco? Sure, I mean, very good question. Um, you know, when I hear the word European identity, um, I, I, my heart doesn't beat faster because 
it, 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 no, no, don't get me wrong, I am a passionate European, but, but, but I, discussions of the European identity tend very quickly to get very woolly indeed and very vague. Um, I think there is a European identity. I think it's here in this room. Most of us, and not all of us, most of us are Europeans. We have made Europe and we have made Europeans and, and we have a great deal in common. Um, European identity is something lived, but what is true is that it has not reached the point um, that there is the same kind of solidarity between Germans and Greeks as there is between Californians and Ohioans. Although, by the way, that itself is not unlimited, <laughs> as any, any of you who know the United States know, but that, that isn't there. So I think where you're right is that you could not build a fiscal and transfer union on some assumption of a fellow feeling, what John Stuart Mill called a fellow feeling that is not strong enough. I think that's right. Uh, I think Angela Merkel should have got up three years ago and not said, we are all Europeans, Greece is the seat of you know, European democracy and therefore we must save the Greeks. I think she should have got up and said, dear compatriots, it is in our own enlightened national self-interest to save the Euro. We have benefited enormously from it. Here are the reasons why. One, two, three, four, five. In any case, the costs, the dangers of a collapse of the Euro are so enormous that we have to do what it takes. And that is the way I would have made the, I would have made the argument much more pragmatically, much more coolly, and I think she could have persuaded the German people on that basis. Uh, Irina, a PhD student at the Research Institute at Maastricht University. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I also really like the ending of the presentation when you said the future is you. And then uh, most of us are still investing actively in our human capital. And my question is, uh, to what extent European Union accumulated human capital is competitive with US or China? To what extent it remain, uh, will remain competitive and whether it's enough invest, uh, investment in it? Thank you. Um, so, this is a difficult one because um, everyone always says, and they're right to a significant degree, that one of Europe's great strengths is its diversity, and I think that is true. But if we are to make the best use of our human capital, for example, in our universities or in our top-end scientific research, then we have to go about pooling some of our resources to compete with the giants. And this is what we're extremely reluctant to do. When we've done it, as for example in CERN or the top-level physics, it's been amazing or our own version of GPS or whatever it may be. There are amazing things we can do. Um, imagine a European football team. Yeah? <laughs> Just imagine if you had the best players from Real Madrid and Manchester United and so on in one team. It would be the most amazing team, would it not? Um, and I think that if we are to realize our human capital you know, to its highest potential, um, we still have to keep our separate teams, particularly Manchester United. <laughs> but I also think, at least in some areas, we need a European team. Um, I have a question concerning Mercosi or uh, Mercolande. Um, with uh, Germany turning more to the east, for example, with Guido Westerwelle <laughs> visiting <laughs> Poland before France, uh, my question is, what do you think, how long can this Franco-German leadership uh, persist, and um, how would the consequences um, of a Franco-German leadership breakup would look like? Thank you very much. So, when everybody was talking about Mercosi, um, 
I um, commented that I thought it was more like Merkel Z, <laughs> which, which I, I think is about right, actually. It's more 70-30 than 50-50. When it comes to the economic and monetary union, and this is the point, that Germany has been catapulted into this leadership role because the economic and monetary union is at the heart of the European crisis. When it comes to Libya or to Africa or to other areas of foreign security policy, it isn't at all. It's a completely different story. There it's actually France and Britain who often play a more important part than Germany witness the intervention in Libya, but in the economic and monetary union, uh, it is clearly Germany which is to a very significant degree calling the shots. And if you recall, Guido Westerweller, who you just mentioned, started a little informal dining club. I think you probably know about this. It's called the Berlin Club. I think 10 sympathetic countries and so on. So clearly there is a leadership, a German leadership position which is not the old Franco-German couple. It's not like that and it's not coming back. And, and you know, Helmut Kohl's, you must always bow three times before the tricolore, his famous line. That, 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 that's not coming back, okay? Angela Merkel is not going to bow three times before the tricolore when Francois Hollande comes to visit. But what I also think is that if France and Germany have irreconcilable positions on the future of the Eurozone, or indeed of the European Union, then we're not going to get anywhere at all. So I do believe that Franco-German understanding is a necessary, but by no means a sufficient condition uh, for finding European leadership. The lady in red over there. Yeah, one or two more questions. Good evening, I'm Veronica, third year student at the University College. Um, you rightly pointed out that um, in terms of security threats, it is very important to have this joint and cooperation, as we saw in Bosnia, um, but also in countries, for instance, Georgia. Uh, but at the same time, you also said that um, sooner or later, it might be China talking to um, Europe 31. So my question is, I'm now wondering, to what extent is enlargement of the European Union possible, especially in the current crisis? And also, to what extent is it sort of attractive for the European Union to carry on it when its task and be this norms transmitter and democratizer of the countries outside of Europe? Thank you. Um, if you don't mind my asking, if it's impolite, where, where do you come from? Czech Republic. Ah, bravo. <laughs> But I, I traveled um, in the Balt Balkans and also visited... Wonderful. Uh, well, one of my favorite countries, the Czech Republic, <laughs> close to my heart, Prague. So you know all about the, the, the difficulties of enlargement and then the benefits of enlargement. Uh, so clearly there is massive enlargement fatigue at the moment. We can all see it. And huge reluctance even to take in the countries of the Western Balkans, which should be relatively easy. Um, let alone the big one, which is Turkey. Um, that, that is clearly the case um, in, in the short term and until we solve our own uh, internal, uh, uh, immediate internal problems. My own view is that it is essential to the future of the European Union that we continue to enlarge continue the process of enlargement. Um, the United States, so far as I know, does not have any plans to get much bigger anytime soon. So far as I know, Canada and Mexico are not, um, well, Canada is not interested in joining and Mexico is the other way around. <laughs> this is still fortunately uh, otherwise in Europe we have the potential to grow our power, including to grow our economic power, to improve our own demography, uh, to improve our own strategic position by enlargement. And in a very competitive world, 
where an aging Europe does not have so many significant competitive advantages, the possibility of enlargement is definitely one of our major competitive advantages. And so I, my answer to your question is, whatever the current morosity and enlargement fatigue, I'm absolutely certain that we should be committed to further enlargement, including Turkey. And if we want to walk with the giants of the 21st century, that's what we need to do. Last question over there. Yes, please. Uh, um, good evening. My name is uh, Russ Kent. I'm a compatriot of yours. I graduated last year from a master's degree here, and I teach European studies in the Hoga School. I am somewhat of a skeptic myself. Yeah. Um, you alluded to... Uh, are you a skeptic or a Euro skeptic? Um, I'm a committed European. I've lived here for uh, 35 years. I'm a committed European, not a federalist. Okay? Um, <laughs> you alluded to your allegiance to Manchester, Manchester United. There has been several allusions, uh, referrals to culture here. And there, you mentioned uh, the term massaging the figures from southern European countries. Is this not the, the cultural difference that exists within uh, the borders of Europe? There are those that will play by the rules and do things as they should be done, and there are those that pretend to play by the rules and do things as they want to do them anyway. And this will ever be the case, and this is why we will never have a successful European fiscal union and European political union. Thank you. I think you qualify as a skeptic, not a Eurosceptic. Uh, <laughs> you know, there was an old joke in, in, in communist Eastern Europe where all the <coughs> communist regimes were called the people's democracies, and the joke was, what's the difference between a democracy and a people's democracy? Answer, it's the difference between a jacket and a straight jacket. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I rather think the same about the difference between a skeptic and a Eurosceptic. Um, but to your point, um, I would distinguish between the short and the long term. As Signor Andriotti delicately alluded to in his conversation with Helmut Kohl, to come back to the beginning of my remarks, the moral, the Steuermoral, I think was the phrase, is perhaps slightly different in some Southern European countries than in some North European countries. And that is obviously the case, that things are done somewhat differently in different places. And therefore, I think there is a good argument that not only was the design of the Eurozone flawed in the lack of a fiscal union built in at the beginning, but it also went too far too fast. Right? I think there's a perfectly reasonable analytical case which is not in any way prejudicial to say that a somewhat smaller Europe, uh, 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 European Monetary Union of more compatible economies would have had a better chance of survival in the storms that hit us from 2008 on. So I think that's absolutely true. But you have to start from where you are, right? To say, to make the, the former statement is not to say that that means we should kick a bunch of countries out or happily let them go. Because as I said, I think the consequence of that would be unpredictable and probably disastrous. So we have to start from where we are. I think we have to recognize that it's a long process, that, Germany, that Greece is not going to become Germany, not going to become Germany ever, but not going to change its ways of doing things overnight. But I have to tell you that one of the great, and I want to end on this note because I think it's a really important one, one of the great fallacies of our time is cultural determinism, right? The belief that because countries are East European or Orthodox or Muslim, therefore they can't possibly be liberal democracies, right? Or have liberal democratic capitalism or the rule of law. That's cultural determinism. It's one of the great fallacies of our time because one of the great stories of the last 50 years is how country after country, which has been written off on cultural grounds, and remember people wrote off Franco's Spain, 
as being culturally incompatible. They wrote off Poland. They wrote off Bulgaria as being culturally incompatible with the rule of law and liberal democracy, have in fact, with time, become liberal democracies and more and more elements of the rule of law. In other words, the great liberal hope is that over time, politics can also change culture. And that is a hope that I think should inform the whole European project. Thank you all very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure Professor Ash could talk for hours on the European Union and on the European crisis, but we have to stop now. Um, I'm not exaggerating by saying that we have witnessed a very impressive, inspiring, eloquent and intellectual lecture on the European crisis and thanks to the European crisis, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and even if the European Monetary Union collapses, we still have a very positive branding from the perspective of Maastricht. Is it not the Maastricht Treaty, then it is Maastricht University, since you were an excellent audience. Thank you for that. Thank you for being with us tonight. And thank you, Professor Ash, for your eloquent lecture. Thank you very much indeed.